Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Reverend Lovisa, and the entire team here again for having me here. It's a joy. Uh, it's a great blessing. I don't take it for granted. I uh, thank you, dear brothers and sisters, uh, for being here again. And uh, we trust that the Lord uh, is going to minister to our hearts. So this morning I've been asked to talk about one body, many gifts. One body, many gifts. And uh, as we begin, I want to ask us to stand. And the choir is going to lead us in um, a song. Please do stand up and um, hold your neighbor's hand. This song is going to usher us into a message this morning. So hold your neighbor's hand so that uh, it will make sense to you. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. There is only one God. Thank you that it pleases you to speak to us again this morning. I pray that indeed this message will be true in this church, will be true, Lord, at our places of work, in our respective schools, that, Lord, you will bind us together, that, Lord, you will bring us to a place of maturity where we can work peacefully with those that you have brought into our lives that we will value each other that we will honor and respect each other Lord and that Lord will use the gifts that you have given us to complement our friends to build up your church Father cause us to understand that we are members of your body and that you are the head we cannot do without you and neither can we do, Lord, without the rest of the members. And so, Lord, may that message come through, come clearly to us by the power of your Spirit. Bless us, Lord, through Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord. Amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> Join me in thanking this anointed choir. I think they've been referred to as band, anointed band. They're, they're really anointed. Um, we thank the Lord so much again. Today we are looking at one body, many gifts. And I want to thank the choir again for leading us in that song. Bind us together, O oh Lord, with cords that cannot be broken. You know, today, the number of things that separate us, isn't it? Yeah, and that's what we want to uh, wrestle with uh, in this topic. Those things that separate us, how can we deal with them? What, are, what, what, what does God want for you and for me? But before we do that, let us look into God's word. Please turn to pause later to the Romans, chapter 12. Verse 3 
to 8. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. From verse 3 to 8. Romans chapter 12. From verse 3 to 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For us in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body, the members. So we, though are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exalts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, <clears throat> yesterday, we looked at um, transformation, isn't it? And uh, we saw that the Apostle Paul challenges us that after receiving the mercies of God, we are to live transformed lives. In response to those mercies, we are to live transformed lives changed lives, that there must be a change in our lives. You know, we looked at a lot of things. Paul tells us to offer ourselves, you know, we are just reviewing what we looked at yesterday. He tells us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And we saw what that means for a child of God. And he challenges us to renew our minds. And when we renew our minds, we are able to discern what God's will is for our lives. And we saw that God's will is good, perfect, and, and pleasing. That's what we saw yesterday. But it doesn't stop there, friends. It doesn't stop there. This morning, God is calling us to a place of maturity. That now that we have received mercies, now that we have embarked on this journey of transformation, that we should live as mature Christians. You hear me? That's why he says from verse 3, if yes, from if you, you, you could project us again from verse 3, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you known to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, Paul is calling us to a place of maturity. He's calling us to, to grow. Yesterday we saw that we have to live transformed lives to serve God. Now, as we serve God, we are going to meet people with different gifts. We are going to meet people that are not like us. So part of transformation is that we are to recognize and appreciate our differences, differences, you know, in our talents, in our gifts, so that we can work with such people. That's why he says that do not think of yourself more highly. Isn't it? Do not think of yourself more highly. 
<laughs> now, think about a car as we begin. I know many of you know how to drive. You are not like me, a villager. <laughs> eh? I, 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 I grew up from a family where we didn't even have an old tire of a car that was hanged somewhere. No, we didn't have. So, think about a car. Hmm? Do you realize that a car needs different parts to move? Isn't it? Remember our topic is one body, many parts. I think a car is the best example we can think about. It has one body, but many parts. What are some of those parts of the, that, that make up a car? Put up your hand and tell me. Yes, my brother. Sorry? The engine. Mm, thank you. Yes. The? The steering wheel. Yes. Thank you. Yes, my brother. The? The gear. Yes. Eh, that one. Uh, I like the way you demonstrate the, that one. You know it. Eh. Eh. Watch Gambaji. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other person? Yes, Ebenezer. The? The exhaust pipe. Thank you, my boy. That is my boy. Yes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other person? Yes. The accelerator. One more person. Yes. Where is El Elijah? Elisha? Huh? He's not here today. Oh, he's there, yes. Uh huh. The last part of a car. Uh huh. <laughs> Somebody say the tires. Mm. Now, let me say, friends, now we know what a car is like. And, and that's the best example we can use as we think about one body. Many parts. Now, God is calling us to this place. Yes, we have been transformed. We have responded to the, his mercies. Now, this is a continuation of our transformation. He's calling us to this place to be like a car. While the engine is the most important, in my view, the engine is the most important part of a car, isn't it? But listen. Listen to me. It needs the other parts of the car to be able to move, isn't it? Can the engine move the car without the tires? Hmm? My sister is saying yes. Uh -huh. Or without the steering? Hmm? Unless you push it. And how do you push it without the steering? You may end up in a forest. Every part is actually important. The side mirrors. Hmm? What about the frame of the car? Where the engine sits? Will the engine move itself if the frame is not there? Hello? And thank you for that song. Bind us together. That is our prayer this morning, that the Lord will bind us together, that we will begin to work, operate like a car. Many parts, but, you know, existing for the same purpose. The other, the, 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 the other song that I thought about uh, is actually a hymn. It says, we are one body in Christ. I think you have heard of this song. We are one body in Christ. Though we are many, we are one body. We are one body in Christ. One faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you agree with that? Binding us together in one cause. Like a car. Like a car. Binding us together in one cause. One hope in the one true God. In the one God. One Father 
over all. Praise the Lord so much. And I'm reminded of another song we used to sing, I think in Sunday school. I, I, I don't remember it exactly. Uh, well, it, it used to say, I don't mind the tribe you belong to as long as Jesus. Uh, and I remember we'd hug each other and say, eh, you're my sister, give me a hug. Mm. So friends, in our passage this morning, we are going to see that each one of you, each one of you, yes, I say that there are many things that separate us today, but in our passage, we're going to see that each one of you is valuable and indispensable to Christ. Each one of you is important. Some other person would say important. It is, imp you know, each one of you is important. <laughs> huh? Each one of you, hey, if there is such a word, each one of you is important, important and indispensable to Christ. Paul is calling us to honor and to minister to each other using our gifts. I know that each one of you has a gift, isn't it? Each one of you has a gift, and God is calling us to use these gifts to build up his church, to minister to each other. Now, let us try to look at these verses, try to digest them. In verse 3, he says that by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that has been assigned. What does this verse mean? What does this mean? It means that self-esteem, as long as it is healthy, is important. Self-esteem. Healthy self-esteem is important. Now let me say that some young people think too little of themselves. They're always underestimating themselves. You know, for me, I come from a poor family. You know, for me, I come from the village. I am a villager. You know, for me, I go to a poor school. Can anything good come out of me? That is not healthy, isn't it? And yet, on the other hand, some young people, some people overestimate themselves. Mm, they overestimate themselves. Don't they know me? <laughs> Can the choir go on without me? I come from the best family, certainly they know. I go to the best school. If I don't go to church, they are not going to do well. The choir will miss me. I am better than everyone in the choir. By the way, they are going even to miss my dressing. I have the best shoes, the coolest shoes. What are you talking about? If I don't go to church, everyone is not going to be happy. I go to the best school. I speak better than all those people. Come on, I am more beautiful than every girl in the choir. I have the best accent. I am more handsome than all the guys there. If I don't go, the girls are going to miss my deeper voice. <laughs> you hear that kind of esteem? That is not healthy. If you think you are above everyone, that is not healthy because Paul is telling us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Paul is calling us to an you know, honest evaluation. The basis of our evaluation here, Paul is saying, should be based on our you know, identity in Jesus Christ. 
Praise the Lord so much. It is Christ, in other words, who enables us to do all that we can do. It is Christ. So if you, if, if, if you are able to do anything in church, you should boast in Christ, in other words, because it is Christ who enables believers. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, Philippians 2, 13, the Bible says that it is him who works in us, both to will and to do for his what? For his perfect glory. It is Christ who works in us. As we are going to see, we're going to see that all these gifts, all that we are, is from the Lord. So, thinking you are more important or better than others means that you are conforming, actually, to the standards of this world. You are not yet transformed, as we saw yesterday. Because that is actually what the people of the world do. They are always thinking about themselves, you know, more highly. I have the best car. I have the most beautiful wife. Come on. I, I, I have everything, you know. And because of that, you can miss your true value in God if you glorify yourself, if you think of yourself more highly. Now, let's move on. In verses 4 to 5, the Bible says, verse 4 to 5, it says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Praise the Lord. Now, Paul uses the analogy of a human body here. Verses 4 to 5. To teach us how we should live and work together. For us, we have already used the analogy of a car. Paul uses the analogy of the body. You know, body parts function under the direction of the brain, isn't it? Body parts function under the direction of the brain. Do you agree with me? The other day, I, I was operated... I, I, I got a problem with my, uh, my left knee. I damaged my anterior crochet ligament, and I was operated. Yeah? You get it? If you don't get it, get it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So when I was operated, I was operated, the operation took a full day. Now, the next morning, the doctor came to check on me. The surgeon. So he told me to, 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 to move my hand. I was able to do that. Now he told me to, 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 to move my leg, the leg that had been operated. I couldn't. I was making the command in the brain, but the command was not reaching the leg. Are you trying to get me? Mm. I would make the command in my head. I would make the command. I would command. But I just couldn't work out. Paul is telling us here that body parts function under the direction of the brain, of the head. And we're going to see later that actually Jesus Christ is the head in this case. is the head of the church. And you and me are members of this head, head of the church, are members of this body. Praise the Lord so much. Christ is the head. And the rest of us are members. Hallelujah. Let me say that. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ. Is up there. When we are boasting we should boast in him. Let me say that the church belongs to Christ. Christ. The church belongs to Christ. Christ lives in the church. He indwells the church. He lives in the church. And he empowers it. In other words, it is Christ who enables us 
to do all that we do in church. Wherever he has called us, it is him who enables us. Can I say this, that Christ is the life source of the church. Christ is your life source. Maybe I didn't define what a church is. Somebody, maybe, But are you talking about, no, I am talking about you. I am talking about, I'm not talking about a church building. I am talking about believers in Christ. We have just said that we are the body of Christ. We are different members of the body of Christ. And I'm simply saying that Christ here is our source of life. Without Christ, the church is lifeless. Christ is the ultimate authority. Ultimate authority. In other words, in whatever we do, we should seek to glorify him, not ourselves. We should seek to please him. Now listen to this, that Christ is the origin of the church. Your grandfather did not start this church. Now some of us come from powerful, you know, church-going families. And sometimes we become a problem. You start telling people, you know, my grandfather gave the land to this church. And my mother is, you know, gives more money than the rest of the people. Therefore, I must sit at the front. Come on. You must respect me. The priest must talk to me in a humble way. Because for me, at this church, you know, <laughs> my father, ha hey, excuse me. Christ is the origin of the church. This church does not belong to your grandfather. Neither does it belong to your parents. It, this church belongs to Christ. Christ loves this church. He died for this church. He is the source of the church. Therefore, if you are there and you're thinking the church is going to collapse because you are not in the choir, the church is going to collapse because you have gone back to school. The church is going to collapse because you are not there. No. No. There is that verse that Reverend Katana loves so much that he says he will establish his church, isn't it? And, and the gates of hell, will, will, nobody will be able to prevail against this church. We are just members, and Christ is the head. And of course, we are going to be saying a little more about that. Now, again, when you look at these verses 4 to 5, we see that we have already seen that the church is like a human body made up, made up of diverse parts and coordinated under the head. Isn't it? So, the church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And together, God's people form the church. God's people. You and me are the church. Praise the Lord so much. So the church is dependent on its head. The church is entirely dependent on Christ. It is not dependent on you. The church is not dependent on the choir. Excuse me. The church is not dependent on human beings. The church is dependent on its head. Jesus Christ. The church can do nothing without Christ. You can do nothing, in other words, without Christ. Jesus is the head over everything. Praise the Lord. The church's, relation, the church's relationship to Christ means that you and me are to accept obediently and fulfill, fulfill faithfully that particular role that God has assigned to you through the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. The church's relationship to Christ means that we have to accept obediently and faithfully do that particular task 
that God has assigned us to do. We have to do to obey and we have to do that particular task faithfully. In other words, God has assigned each one of you a particular task. He has given each one of you a gift as we are going to see. And you are to use that obediently and faithfully. Obediently and faithfully. Praise the Lord so much. So the underlying message of verses 4 to 5 is that each one of you is important before Christ. Each one of you is valuable. Each one of you has got a particular task that God has called you to do. Each one of you has got something to do for the Lord. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 it says that having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith. Praise the Lord. Now, in, in, in verse 6 here, we see that God has given us gifts. And these gifts are to be used to build up the church. Praise the Lord so much. They are to be used not for our individual interests, but to build up the church. Now, let me say a few things here about spiritual gifts. About seven things I want to say about spiritual gifts. And... Each one of these is really true about spiritual gifts. Number one, all spiritual gifts come from God. They don't come from your parents. All spiritual gifts come from, from God. Hallelujah. Amen. Remember when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we put our faith in him, we accept him. He gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal that we are his. Now the Holy Spirit begins to work in us. And through the Spirit of God, God gives us spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts come from God. Number two, not everyone has the same gift. Not everyone has the same gift. Number three, we need to know who we are and what we, and what we do best. We need to know who we are and what we do best. In other words, we need to know what our gift is, what my gift is. Some of you want to do everything. <laughs> you think you can do everything. You can be everywhere. Huh? Why are you pointing at your neighbor? Gifts, number four, are to be used to serve God, not our personal interests. This is in line, actually, with what we said yesterday. We saw that we are to give ourselves as living sacrifices, prioritizing the things of God. So the point is that we are to use our gifts to serve God, not our personal interests. Number five, we are to use our gifts exhaustively, not reservedly. Does that confuse us? We are to use our gifts, in other words, to, to the fullest point, exhaustively. So if, in other words, if your gift is singing, when you come here to sing, you, 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 you sing with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, as though singing for the Lord. The Apostle Paul tells us in, in Colossians chapter 3, and verse 23, Colossians 3, 23, he says that whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord. For you know that you receive an inheritance from the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, give your best. Number six, gifts differ in nature, power, and effectiveness. Gifts differ in nature, power, and effectiveness. We may have the same gift, but we may not be at the same level of anointing because God has given you know, each one of us grace, apportioned each one of us. So they differ in nature, in power, and effectiveness. You know, according to the grace given to us. But not our faith. Somebody may say, 
Uh, for me, I think I lack enough faith. That's why I am not as anointed as so and so. No. Lastly, number seven, we are to be faithful while using our gifts. In other words, use our gifts to serve God and his people. To serve God and his people. We are to be faithful while using our gifts. To serve God and his people. Now, when you look at verses 7 to 8, verses, to seven, verses 7 to 8, now Paul outlines these gifts. Verse 7 to 8, he says, If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exalts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So look at the list of gifts and imagine how rich the church is because we say that we are to use each of our gifts to the glory of God. I want you to imagine how rich the church is. Look at the people here. Each one of us here has a gift. So the church is rich. He talks about prophets. Now prophets often boldly and articulately preach or speak God's message. Forget the prophets of Kampala who deceive us. They tell us, you know, Uganda Cranes is going to win the Africa Cup and doesn't even qualify. <laughs> Gifts, I mean, prophets often boldly and articulately speak the word of God. Prophets do not necessarily tell the future, no. Their primary work role is to tell, to speak the word of God. Number two, we, we are told about those who are called to serve. People like me, people like Reverend Lovinsa, th those are called to ministry. And these are to be ideally faithful and loyal. He talks about teachers. Teachers are usually great thinkers. Talks about encouragers. Now the encouragers usually motivate others. They motivate, they encourage. He talks about the givers. These ones give generously with trust that the Lord will bless them. He talks about leaders. Leaders are good at organizing and managing. Leaders like my brother Malcolm. They are good at organizing and managing. He talks about those who show kindness. Those who show kindness. These are caring and they give time to others. Again, it's important for you to see, to reflect on your gift. Well, we can add to this list. This is not exhaustive. We can add to this list when we read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 7 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 11. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We can look out for more spiritual gifts when we, um, when we read those verses. Now, let me say that it is not common to find someone who possesses all these gifts. It is rare to find a prophet who is also a giver, isn't it? And it is rare to find a giver who is also a good counselor. So it is important to identify your gift or go to a pastor, go to the reverence here to help you know your gift and use that gift to the glory of God. So what is our take home as we come to the close? I want to attempt to answer two questions here as we end. Number one, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? I want to suggest three things. What does it mean to be the body of Christ? Three things here. Number one, to operate or to work as the body of Christ calls each person to seek to know and function in accord with their role assigned by God. Let me say this again. It means that we seek to know and function in accord with the role assigned by God. God has assigned each one of us a role. We need to know it and function in that role assigned by God. Each one of us has a particular role 
that God has assigned to us. Number two, every believer is valuable and every believer is indispensable to Christ. Praise the Lord. So we need each other as we serve God. We need each other in church. Because each one of us brings something valuable to the body of Christ. Each one of us has something valuable and unique that they bring on the table. Praise the Lord so much. Yes. Can I say this? That you don't have it all together. You don't have it all together. But together we have it all. Did you hear that? You don't have it as a person. You don't have it all together. But together we have it all. Praise the Lord so much. So the church needs every member with their unique gifts. They are all, they are all valuable. They are all important to the body of Christ. Number three, we are to honor each other and minister to each other. We are to honor each other and minister to each other. Honor the people that you serve with. Do not think you are more talented, more gifted than them. Honor them and use your gift to minister to them. Praise the Lord so much. Question number two. How best can we use our spiritual gifts according to uh, these verses that we have been looking at? How best can we use our spiritual gifts? Number one. Let me begin by saying that spiritual gifts are for those who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, this does not apply to you. Spiritual gifts are for those who have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit graciously gives different gifts. In other words, spiritual gifts are possessed by Christians. Hallelujah. The question is, are you a Christian? Is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? So if you have a spiritual gift, use your spiritual gift to build up the church. To build up the church and to strengthen the members of this church. Use your spiritual gift to build up the church and to strengthen the members of this church. Use your spiritual gift to serve the whole body of Christ. Use your spiritual gift to serve the whole body of Christ. Yes, we may have different gifts and abilities, but we are to work together using these gifts for the glory of God. Your gift alone cannot do the work of God. Did you hear that? Your gift alone cannot do the work of God. Next, be thankful. Be thankful for people whose gifts are completely different from yours. Do not envy them. Some, some of us, you know, we begin to, to, to feel eh, something at heart, which the young people call akasajia. Mm. You develop akasajia at heart because somebody has a better, you, you, you feel that somebody is better than you at something. The point is be thankful for those people whose gifts are completely different from yours. And allow them to serve and thrive. Allow them to serve and thrive. Because somebody has a good voice, a good tenor, you, you, you deny them the microphone. <laughs> because they're going to, eh? <laughs> no. Be thankful and allow them to thrive. Give them opportunity. Lastly, let your strength complement other people's weaknesses. Do not get puffed up. If you're good at something... Let that compliment other people. Do not be puffed up. Do not say, I am better. Do not say, <laughs> the choir is going to collapse. No. Let your strength compliment others. Now, a few questions to ask us. What issues divide up Christ's church today? Maybe this could um, enrich our discussions after here. What issues divide up Christ's church today? Number two. 
How does the church misuse spiritual gifts? How does the church misuse spiritual gifts today? Number three, what should the church do to ensure proper use of spiritual gifts? I can give this paper to, uh, the, the, you know, this list to a group leader. What should the church do to ensure proper use of spiritual gifts? Lastly, what contribution can you make to the body of Christ as an individual? What contribution can you make to the body of Christ? Conclusion. Each one of you has a specialized gift given by God. Did you hear that? And you must discover that gift and use it to serve God and his people. Not to serve yourself. Also, you must nurture each other's gifts to grow. Nurture each other's gifts to grow. Yes. Will you commit to serve God's church with the gifts he has given you while appreciating the uniqueness of other Christians, of other members of the body of Christ? What things will you do to remain united with the rest of the believers? What will you do? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church and for each one of us, men and women, young and old, thank you. And thank you for the gifts that you have given each one of us. Lord, this morning you are calling us to realize that all the gifts we have are from you. You're calling us to a place of maturity. You are calling us, Lord, to be humble. So I pray that you will deal with every spiritual pride. I pray that, Lord, you deal with every selfishness. Especially in the way we use our gifts. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to see and to hear what you want us to do, Lord, using our gifts in your church. Yes, Lord, we know that this is your church. It does not belong to any of us. I pray that, Lord, you help us to realize that you are the head of the church and that, Lord, we will stop bragging, stop thinking that this church depends on us. The church depends on you. The church can do nothing without you. And yet this church can go on without us. So I pray that, Lord, you continue to speak to us even as we break into our small groups, that your spirit will continue to teach that your spirit will continue to rebuke, that your spirit will continue to instruct us to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.